Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Mutiullah, Associate Professor of Medicine, and today I will be dis discussing the topic of hyperthermia and fever. And in the end, we will uh, slightly discuss the unrelated but similar disorder of hypothermia. These two terms, hyperthermia and fever, although both uh, signify increased body temperature, but they are two distinct entities with uh, uh, entirely different mechanisms and entirely different management strategies. So first of all, we will go for definition of both these terms uh, because it's very important to differentiate these two. It's entirely different mechanisms and entirely different management strategies. So you must uh, differentiate whether the high uh, body temperature is due to hyperthermia or fever. Hyperthermia is the elevation of body temperature above normal due to excessive heat production or inability to lose heat. In this case, hypothalamus, which is the mastermind behind control of body temperature, uh, is not involved and its set point at which it operates for control of body temperature uh, is not changed. While on the other hand, fever is the elevation of body temperature above normal due to increase in the set point at which it operates in the hypothalamus from normothermic to febrile ranges. So here uh, behind the elevated temperature is the hypothalamic set point elevation. Uh, this elevation of set point occurs from two conditions, either pyrogens, which are small molecules released endogenously or exogenously due to infections, or uh, lesions in the brain causing uh, change in the hypothalamic uh, functioning. In this case, which will be, it will be called central fever. Briefly, we will discuss the physiology of body con uh, temperature control system, although you have all studied it in physiology, but just to uh, remind in your uh, memories. Uh, like most of the home homeostatic sy systems occurring, uh, operating in the body, temperature control also operates via a negative feedback mechanism. A negative feedback mechanism is, is the one in which the end product or output of a system causes inhibition of the uh, system itself. That's why a uh, normal uh, steady state condition is maintained. Body temperature is among the most precisely controlled homeostatic parameters in the human body and it is understandable because most of the metabolic functions highly depend upon a normal ambient temperature in the body and only minor variations in uh, body temperature can cause drastic changes in metabolic functions. Just I will give a little idea of how efficient this system is. Then feedback mechanisms, are, the efficiency of feedback mechanism is usually judged by the so-called gain of that system. I will not go into detail how this gain is calculated, but the better receptor is reflex, which is responsible for maintaining uh, body uh, blood pressure during postural changes in a normal healthy person and activates via better receptors in the carotid sinus has a feedback gain of almost one. While on the other hand, body temperature control mechanism has a feedback gain of almost 33. So by this uh, way, you can have an idea how efficient and precisely controlled is the body temperature. The average body temperature checked by oral, which does not properly represent the core body temperature is 36.7 degree. Rectal temperature, which uh, precisely represents the core temperature, is usually 0.5 centigrade or 0.9 degree Fahrenheit higher, and higher than the oral reading. There is normally a diurnal variation in body temperature with the early morning temperatures uh, 0.5 degree centigrade lesser than the late evening temperatures. Temperature levels above these average ranges are called fever or pyrexia. So by this term, the uh, early morning temperature of 37.2, above 37.2 or 98.9 .9 degree, or a evening temperature of more than 37.7, equivalent to more than 99.9, .9, defines a fever. This is an example, same example of body temperature controlled by negative feedback mechanism. If the body temperature starts to decline due to some ambient condition or whatever, it activates the hypothalamus to take emergency measures to produce heat and conserve heat so that the body temperature starts elevating and once it reaches normal, it suppresses the mechanism and the patient starts feeling comfortable and the signs of shivering and uh, heat conservation are lost. On the other hand, 
if the body temperature starts to rise due to any condition the hypothalamic centers are activated measures are taken so that sweating increases and skin uh, circulation of blood also increases leading to excessive uh, dissipation of heat which leads to normalization of temperature again and the patient starts feeling uh, comfortable because the hypothalamic center now is inhibited by this elevation uh, depression of the temperature to normal so that's how the negative feedback loop functions so we have seen an early morning temperature of more than 37.2 or evening temperature of more than 37.7 is called fever by a, by a fever of more than 41.5 degree centigrade which is equivalent to 106.7 is called hyperparesia it is is an unusual condition the uh, importance of this uh, um, break point of 41.5 degree centigrade we will discuss later on under neutral environmental conditions body produces more heat than is necessary to maintain the, maintain the core body temperature and this heat is produced by metabolic activities mainly in the liver and in the muscles the metabolic activity and heat production of liver is more or less a steady state throughout the day while in muscles is it, it is highly dependent upon the physical activity under uh, resting conditions uh, the heat produced by muscles is minimal while in excessive exercise uh, more metabolic activity leads to excessive heat production and acquires the major part contribution to the heat production because the muscle mass makes up up to 40% of the total body mass that's why these uh, 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 heat production under physical activity uh, is important during uh, exercise on the other hand heat is lost which is excess heat is lost dissipated through two two ways that is the skin and the lungs here also lungs are contribute minor to a heat dissipation and is more or less steady state while skin uh, dissipation is highly variable and depends upon the subcutaneous blood circulation this blood circulation is highly variable and is a special mechanism for dissipation of heat uh, blood circulation through the skin capillaries can vary from barely above zero to as much as 30% of the total cardiac output depending upon the need of uh, heat dissipation for conservation so by these mechanisms despite environmental variations our normal body temperature is maintained this control is achieved by the thermoregulatory functions of hypothalamus which acts as a mastermind behind all these mechanisms especially the supraoptic nuclei in the hypothalamus however it should be remembered that various physical activities can normally increase body temperature these are certain conditions physical and emotional which can cause normally elevated body temperature however it should be remembered that this uh, elevation is uh, only transient and once this condition is uh, normalized the temperature also comes back to normal so in cases of uh, emotions or hard exercise you can ex expect normal body temperature of 38 or even above Uh, degree centigrade uh, which will not be considered fever but they will be normal phys physiological response and will return back to normal when these emotions or physical activity uh, has ceased the uh, hypothalamic centers uh, uh, work in a feedback loop as i have already told the afferent loop of the uh, limb of the loop uh, comprises afferent uh, signals from two sources one is peripheral nerves via cutaneous thermal receptors uh, which is in contact with external environment and temperature of the blood which is bathing the region or hypothalamus itself so it receives receives signals both from the uh, periphery and also from the core so any discrepancy in these two readings immediately uh, activates appropriate mechanism to restore these abnormalities Uh, then the efferent limb of the hypothalamic control system uh, consists of dissipating the heat by four mechanisms these are the four mechanisms by conduction to directly uh, at the, um, the, the, the objects which are in direct contact with the body the heat is conducted or by convection of air currents heat is dissipated then radiation through the skin to the uh, ambient environment or evaporation of sweat Uh, also leads to uh, heat dissipation these are the four major mechanisms by which heat is dissipated from the skin on the other hand uh, 
raising uh, these uh, dissipation uh, mechanisms are effective when the body temperature is rising on the other hand if the body temperature is falling then conservation of heat or heat production are the major mechanisms heat conservation is by cutaneous vasoconstriction because less blood is flowing to the skin and less dissipation of heat is occurring heat is being conserved and on the other hand at the same time heat production is uh, achieved by shivering and non shivering mechanisms while non shivering mechanisms are uh, less uh, important in adults shivering mechanism which uh, uh, involves active uh, movement of the skin of the muscles thereby increasing metabolic activity and producing heat so if the body temperature is rising heat dissipation mechanisms are activated and if body temperature is falling then heat conservation and heat production mechanisms are activated these are the different limbs of the loop of thermoregulation these are the four mechanisms by which the body dissipates heat air conduction which uh, sorry conduction of heat to uh, objects which are in direct contact of the body then uh, convection of air currents heat dissipation then radiation to the ambient environment directly from the skin and then evaporation of sweat uh no, under neutral conditions sweat evaporation contributes to only about 20% of heat dissipation but as the body temperature rises uh, ambient temperature rises conduction and convection becomes increasingly less efficient and indeed once the temperature ambient temperature starts to rise above body temperature the transfer of heat in the opposite direction that is it is being transferred from the environment to the body so in this condition evaporation takes on more and more uh, efficient and important role by excessive sweat production so under neutral condition conduction convection and radiation are important and in the uh, extreme conditions of heat evaporation of uh, sweat production acquires the major uh, part of the heat dissipation mechanisms so summarizing all these mechanisms if the body temperature is rising the increased temperature is sensed by the hypothalamus it leads to cutaneous vasodilatation and sweat production it leads to dissipation of heat and dropping temperature and the loop is closed by a normalized temperature on the other hand if the body temperature is falling this is also sensed by the hypothalamus it activates the peripheral vasoconstriction thereby conserving heat on the other hand it produces excessive heat by shivering in which shaking of the muscles produces excessive metabolic activity and heat and which leads to warming of the body and thus thereby maintaining the body temperature this diagram depicts the uh, physiology of cutaneous circulation these are the subcutaneous vessels and these are the arteriovenous shunts anastomoses these are most important in this uh, heat dissipation mechanism because once they are constricted there is minimal flow through the skin and the heat is being conserved when they are dilated then more blood is flow, uh, flowing through the skin and dissipating heat and this is the mechanism of uh, sweat production the sweat gland itself is uh, supplied by sympathetic cholinergic nerve fibers which is activated leads to initial secretion of uh, uh, sweat which is modified during transfer through the duct in which important electrolytes are reabsorbed and finally the sweat is uh, produced from the pore which is evaporated to produce choline now hyperthermia this is an un uncontrolled increase in body temperature that exceeds the body ability to lose the heat this excessive heat can come from the either from the environment or from the excessive internal metabolism which produces heat and this uh, heat burden is exceeding the normal cap capability of the body to lose heat the setting of the hypothalamic thermoregulatory center is unchanged and pyrogens are not involved it is simply the balance between heat production and heat dissipation however it should be remembered that under extreme elevation of body temperature hypothalamic centers may stop functioning and heat will uh, start to be conserved rather than being dissipated and which will lead to further rapid increase of body temperature to very high levels this we will discuss subsequently uh, but the hypothalamic set point is not changed so hyperthermia occurs when either uh, body metabolic heat production or environmental heat load exceeds normal heat losing capacity 
or when the heat load is normal but there is impaired capability of heat loss. In these conditions, body temperature may rise to levels which are capable of producing irreversible protein denaturation and resulting severe brain damage which is also irreversible. So this is a condition which should be recognized early and aggressively treated otherwise the outcome will be very poor. These are the certain conditions which predispose the patient to hyperthermia. Top of the list is heat stroke which is a major environmental disease. This is of two types as we will see exertional in which uh, healthy normal people are doing excessive strenuous exercise in a hot or humid environment. On the other hand, the other is the non-exertional or classical in which uh, people are exposed to heat but they have some uh, problem uh, of this heat dissipation, for example, taking anticholinergic drugs, antiperfunctionian drugs, or they are dehydrated due to uh, diuretics or some other drugs, psychotropic drugs they are taking. Even without physical activity, when they are exposed to hot environment, they start having elevated body temperature because of poor capability to dissipate heat. Then drug-induced hyperthermia, several drugs like stimulants, as uh, amphetamines, cocaine, pencyclidine, methylene, dioxy, metamphetamine, also called ecstasy, lysergic acid, diethylamide, which is also called LSD. These are usual recreational drugs used as illicit drugs. Other drugs like salicylates, lithium, anticholinergics, which impair uh, sweat production due to their anticholinergic properties, and sympathomimetics, also stimulant drugs. Then there is an entity of neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is an idiosyncratic reaction to certain of the psychotropic drugs. This occurs only in genetically predisposed person on routine doses of these drugs. These drugs include the phenothiazines, butyrophenones, SSS, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like fluoxetine, tricyclic dibenzodiazepines, anti-dopaminergics like metoclopramide, or sudden withdrawal of dopaminergic drug. Because as we will see, the uh, underlying pathology is suspected to be under activity of the major inhibitory peptide, which is dopamine. So wherever there is suppression of uh, dopaminergic uh, receptors, this neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurs, which leads to rapid elevation of uh, body temperature in response to certain drugs in genetically predisposed people. Similar syndrome is the serotonin syndrome. This is not anaphylactic, uh, idiosyncratic, rather it occurs due to inappropriate use or excessive doses of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are commonly used antidepressants or um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors or even tricyclic antidepressants. Then there is a condition called malignant hyperthermia, which also occurs in genetically predisposed people when they are exposed to certain inhalational anesthetics like halocaine or the muscle paralyzing agent like succinylcholine. So it occurs mainly during anesthesia in those persons who have a genetic abnormality in sarcoplasmic reticulum, which leads to excessive calcium release and uh, muscle stiffness, increased metabolism, leading to very rapid elevations of body temperatures to high levels. Certain endocrinopathies like thyrotoxicosis and pheochromocytoma, which are associated with excessive body metabolism and heat production, are also predisposed to hyperthermia. And finally, certain central nervous system uh, disorders which can damage the hypothalamus, like cerebral hemorrhage, status epilepticus, or hypothalamic injury can cause hyperthermia. So, uh, we will discuss heat stroke in detail because it's the most common uh, environmental emergency and uh, requires aggressive treatment, early recognition, otherwise it has a poor prognosis. Heat injury presents with a spectrum of preventable heat related illnesses from minor to severe including heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat syncope and progressing to the most severe form of heat stroke. This occurs from exposure to excessive heat, especially in humid environment, where all our heat dissipating mechanisms are impaired, are inefficient, and if there is impaired ability of the body to lose heat. As I have already told, as the ambient temperature uh, reaches bo uh, body temperature, the uh, heat dissipation via conduction and convection are lost, and if it elevates above body temperature, the heat transfer is actually in the reverse di uh, direction, that is 
body is receiving heat from the environment. In this case, heat uh, loss is mainly by our radiation in association with evaporation of sweat. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, sweat production and evaporation becomes the major uh, mechanism of heat dissipation. But if the uh, ambient uh, humidity is also increasing, sweat production also becomes increasingly less efficient. So humidity in the face of high temperatures is highly um, um, uh, predisposing to heat injury conditions. There are two types of uh, heat stroke, a classical or non-exertional type in which patients who are uh, already predisposed to uh, excessive heat, for example, due to some uh, underlying condition, they are elderly, they are bedridden or inefficient acclimatization. Acclimatization is a physiological condition in which the body gradually gets acclimatized to a new environment. Uh, but it requires some time. And if some person rapidly transfers, travels to from an, a temperate climate to a harsh climate, he is uh, not acclimatized and he is at high risk of developing uh, uh, heat stroke. But if it, this uh, transit is, is uh, gradual, with uh, giving time, with gradual uh, change in uh, environment, then the body gets acclimatized and the patient becomes slightly prone to, uh, immune from this heat injury. Dehydration also predisposes to uh, uh, heat injury because of impaired uh, sweat production. Certain skin uh, disorders which uh, impair heat dissipation through skin or medical conditions. Obesity due to excessive insulation of sub, uh, subcutaneous fat. Prolonged seizures, reduced cutaneous blood flow. Drugs that increase uh, metabolism or impair sweating or withdrawal of certain of the dopaminergic drugs. All these heat stroke and these people when they are exposed to excessive heat, even with excessive exercise, they can develop heat stroke. The other is the exertional type heat stroke in which uh, uh, a healthy person continues to work strenuously under hot and humid environment and develops heat stroke. Dehydration is an important contributor factor and this should be always remembered if you are working in hot environment to keep yourself properly hydrated. It, occur, it um, predisposes in two mechanisms. Number one, it reduces cutaneous blood flow because the uh, patient is dehydrated already. The cardiac output is low, so the cutaneous blood flow is also low. So heat dissipation is impaired and it also impairs sweat production. It should be remembered that under very harsh condition, sweat produ production can increase one liter per hour. So definitely you require some uh, stores of water to produce sufficient amount of uh, sweat. A clinical features of heat, heat injury can start from minor like heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat syncope and ultimately finally if not recognized earlier can progress to heat stroke. Heat stroke is recognized by hyperthermia with cerebral dysfunction in a patient with exposure to heat. So cerebral dysfunction is the defining condition of heat stroke in the face of hyperthermia due to exposure to heat. This is, a, as I already told, it is a life-threatening emergency and signs may be quite non-specific, so a high index of suspicion is required for early diagnosis and good outcome. Patient may present with painful muscle cramps, headache, dizziness, fatigue, and anxiety. There may be nausea, vomiting, and malaise associated with tachycardia. Patient may collapse after prolonged exertion in hot environment. And these symptoms may progress to heat stroke, which is defined by the hallmark of cerebral dysfunction and with rising temperature. Poor body temperature is frequently above 40 degrees centigrade. And in this condition, symptoms include in addition to the above mentioned uh, conditions, plus the uh, neurological symptoms, including weakness, confusion, delirium, blurred vision, convulsions, collapse, and progressing to unconsciousness. Uh, frequently, the sweating may be absent. This is because at very high body temperatures, the hypothalamic control mechanism fails and uh, uh, rather than dissipating heat, the body starts conserving heat in the, in the face of excessive heat production. And this leads to further rapid rise in body temperature to 
seriously high levels. So sweating is not important. Usually patients are dry. In this case, core body temperature should be obtained by uh, rectal or esophageal thermometers because uh, skin or oral temperatures are not reliable. These patients should be monitored for kidney injury, liver failure, metabolic derangement like, like, like acidosis or electrolyte imbalance, respiratory compromise, coagulopathy, or ischemia, which are frequently associated with this condition. This condition can lead to multi-organ system failure. That's why it should be very vigilantly uh, treated. Hyperthermia due to drugs is a rapidly life-threatening condition and should be recognized in appropriate clinical setting. Means the presentation will be almost the same like heat injury, but the history defines whether it is drug-induced or whether it is environmentally induced hyperthermia. And finally, it is important to distinguish between fever and hyperthermia. As I have already told, there are, there, are, there are two entirely distinct entities with distinct mechanisms and entirely different treatment strategies. Drug-induced hyperthermia is an increasingly uh, uh, common condition because of the use of psychotropic drugs. Common in, uh, culprits are amphetamines and other stimulants, illicit drugs like pencyclidine, LSD and ecstasy or cocaine, atropine and other cholinergics, and uh, tricyclic antidepressants are also important. All these drugs can predispose to hyperthermia even without exposure to heat. Overdoses of serotonin reuptake inhibitors like fluoxetine or sertraline or uh, especially if they are taken in association with monoamine oxidase inhibitors can lead to excessive serotonin uh, syndrome. Uh, this, has, this syndrome has many features overlapping with neuroleptic malignant syndrome which we will be discussing later on but there are some distinguishing features like lead fibrosity or diarrhea which distinguish this syndrome from NMS. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is, uh, as I told, already told, this occurs in genetically predisposed uh, people and uh, is an idiosyncratic response to usual psychotropic drugs and is a catatonia-like state and occurs in genetically predisposed patients. It occurs in the setting of neuroleptic agents uh, like phenothiazine, haloperidol, prochlorperazine, and uh, dopamine antagonists like metoclopramide or sudden withdrawal of dopaminergic drugs. It is characterized by lead pipe type of muscle rigidity, extrapyramidal side effects, and autonomic dysregulation and hyperthermia. This is thought to be caused by inhibition of central dopamine receptor, which is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And uh, this results in increased heat generation and decreased heat dissipation. This is the comparison between NMS and serotonin syndrome. While rigidity is prominent in both, it is more important in NMS, like lead pipe type of rigidity. Hyperthermia is also common. Autonomic liability manifested by tachycardia and labile blood pressure are also common. However, renal failure and markedly elevated creatine kinase, which signifies damage to the muscle, is more specific for NMS, while diarrhea, dilated pupils, and myoclonus are more prominent in serotonin syndrome. And altered mental status leading to confusion, delirium, and coma are also common to both. Another condition, malignant hyperthermia, uh, which occurs in response to anesthetics like halothane or uh, muscle uh, paralyzing agents like succinylcholine. These in individuals which have an inherited abnormality in skeletal muscle sarcoplasmic reticulum, which causes a rapid increase in intracellular calcium levels leading to increased metabolism and stiffness in the muscle leading to heat generation. Elevated temperature, increased muscle metabolism, muscle rigidity and rhabdomyolysis, acidosis and cardiovascular instability develop within minutes. So it should be uh, recognized immediately during anesthesia and anesthesia immediately aborted. Otherwise the prognosis is very poor. This condition is rare but is often fatal. Regarding men, we will mainly focus on heat-related injuries, but it should be remembered that basic steps in all types of hyperthermia are the same. That is, rapid decrease in body temperature to a safe range. Other conditions are also similar, so we will be discussing them one by one.
high index of suspicion is important uh, for early diagnosis and good outcome. Mild symptoms may be managed by moving the patient to cool and shaded area. Oral replacement of water and electrolytes is important if the patient is conscious enough. Otherwise, if he is uh, having fever, uh, having vomiting or unconsciousness, then intravenous fluid replacement with glucose or saline infusions is important. Body temperature should be reduced if it is significantly raised and it should be observed for complications like hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock, metabolic abnormalities, cardiac arrhythmias, coagulopathy, acute respiratory distress syndrome, hypoglycemia, rhabdomyolysis, seizures, and organ dysfunction or occult infections, all which can occur in all these syndromes and can be easily overlooked. So you should be vigilant to look for these complications. If the patient is very sick and comes to you in unconscious state, then the primary attention is to ABC, that is the airway. If it is clear, breathing is okay and circulation is maintained by good uh, pulse and uh, blood pressure. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, temperature should be rapidly reduced within one hour. There are three main mechanisms of uh, uh, temperature uh, reduction. One is the very common one which we commonly practice, evaporative method, in which the body is sprinkled with tap water and cooled by fans. Other is conductive based, in which uh, ice packs or immersion into ice water is used, or uh, if it is still, still not reduced, then uh, infusion of cool fluids and gastric lavage with cold water. And the third is extracorporeal systems like hemodialysis with using cool dialysate. If it is available, it is very effective in reducing core body temperature. Then supporting circulation and perfusion of the body organs by appropriate fluids and in, uh, inotropic agents if it is required. Monitoring of vital signs is important. Pulse oximetry and uh, charting of intake and output. Uh, in this case, uh, while giving IV fluids, fluid overload should always be avoided because it can result in poor outcome in the case of uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, if it is anesthesia-induced malignant hyperthermia, then anesthesia or uh, any suspected drugs should be immediately discontinued. If there is significant muscle rigidity, then dentrolene intravenously is given. It is especially effective in malignant hyperthermia and also in other conditions like drug-induced or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. If there is significant muscle rigidity, then this can be used and effective. But if uh, muscle rigidity and hyperactivity is still not controlled, then induction of neuromuscular paralysis with a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker uh, should be given. And in this case, of course, the patient requires mechanical ventilation because after neuromuscular blockade, he will not be able to breathe spontaneously. Because it has been hypothesized that uh, underactivity of dopamine receptors is uh, culprit in drug-induced hyperthermia, then so dopamine agonists like bromocaptine have been advocated in NMS and other drug-induced hyperthermia, but the use, uh, use is still controversial. Shivering must be avoided by cooling because we are inducing cooling rapidly. The patient may have shivering, which will be counterproductive because of uh, increased heat generation. So it should be avoided by opiate analgesics, benzodiazepines, or quick-acting anesthetic agents. Antipyretics like paracetamol and aspirin are ineffective or contraindicated because they can impair with heat uh, dissipation. And this treatment should be con continued until a safe body temperature of at least 39 degrees is achieved. Uh, prevention is important. In this case, education of people who are predisposed to such conditions is also important, like training of athletes regarding reducing the risk and early recognition of symptoms. Then physical examination for determining if the patient are at uh, high risk and risk reduction by improvement in drugs or other medical conditions. Fluid intake should be uh, increased. Uh, you might have seen that people who are having marathon races they continue taking some liquids throughout the race and because it provides them with adequate uh, water and electrolytes. And acclimatization by stepwise exposure is also important. Suddenly going out at, at to work in harsh environment is highly uh, risky. Mortality is high from heat stroke, most commonly secondary to multi-organ dysfunction as well as rhabdomyolysis, 
acute respiratory distress syndrome and inflammation even after the temperature has normalized. So even if you have normalized the body temperature, the patient is still not out of risk and should be monitored for a certain period of time. And following recovery from heat stroke, immediate heat exposure to ambient heat should be avoided because they are still at risk. Now, the other entity of uh, body temperature elevation, fever and hyperparexia. Uh, we have briefly discussed the pathogenesis of fever, there are, which is induced by pyrogens. Pyrogens are any substance which can cause fever uh, by increasing the set point of uh, thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus. These pyrogens can be of two types. One are exogenous, which are derived from bacteria like endotoxin from gram negative septicemia or staphylococcal toxin or toxin from the agent of uh, scarlet fever. These are exogenous pyrogens. And there are pyrogenic cytokines, which are small pro proteins, uh, which are released by inflammatory cells of the immune system in response to some infection or inflammation. And these include interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, which was previously called endogenous pyrogens and the various interferons. They are released in response to infection by the inflammatory cells of the host defense system. The infections cause release of pyrogenic cytokines, either exogenous or endogenous, but fever can be a manifestation of other processes like inflammation, trauma or tissue necrosis, in which case also inflammatory cells are activated and release these pyrogens. Pyrogens in turn cause elevation of hypothalamic set point of, for body temperature regulation. These are the events in the production of fever. You can see infection by uh, um, micro pathogens or some inflammation or immune responses. They lead to activation of the inflammatory cells, monocytes, macrophages, or endothelial cells, or others, which release pyrogenic uh, cytokines, including interleukin 1, 6, tumor necrosis factor, and interferon which circulate in the blood circulation, reach the hypothalamus, where they activate the cyclooxygenase pathway of uh, uh, metabolism, leading to production of prostaglandin E2. This prostaglandin E2 uh, leads to rapid rise in uh, cyclic AMP locally, which is an intracellular signaling pathway, which leads to ultimately elevated thermoregulatory set points, and then the hypothalamus starts the mechanisms of heat conservation and heat production uh, in the face of normal body temperature, and this leads to development of fever. Similarly, microbial toxins also work uh, independently, circulate to the uh, hypothalamus, and there they produce the similar changes of prostaglandin E2, cyclic AMP, and elevation of the set point of the hypothalamus. Uh, febrile response tends to, to be greater in children than in adults. This is probably because of stronger immune response in the children. But the degree of temperature elevation does not necessarily correspond to the severity of illness. Indeed, it has been found in various studies that higher uh, temperatures are found to be associated with better ou outcome and shorter stay in the hospital in patients with severe sepsis. In older patients, neonates, and persons receiving certain medications like non steroidal drugs, corticosteroids, a normal temperature or even hypothermia may be observed in overwhelming infection. So uh, temperature elevation is not an absolute marker of severity of infection. People who receive anti-cytokine therapy, uh, usually in uh, idiopathic inflammatory conditions, this also blunts the febrile response because it inhibits the inflammatory cells of the uh, immune system, which leads to profound immune suppression. That is why the opportunistic, infection, uh, opportunistic infections uh, reported in these patients on anticytokine therapy are similar to those reported in HIV-infected persons. So it leads to profound immunosuppression and the response to uh, invading pathogen is blunted. So even low-grade fever in these patients is considered to be a significant uh, elevation and is treated as uh, septicemia. Hyperparexia is a condition in which fever elevates to more than 41.5 or 106.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is called hyperparexia. Uh, this is uh, an unusual occurring. Fever due to infectious disease rarely exceeds 
This natural thermal sealing is probably mediated by neuropeptides that function as a central antibiotic. So as I told in the um, uh, early uh, lecture, that hyperthermia has no limits. It can, body temperatures can continue to rise uh, and there is no natural sealing. But for fever, there is natural sealing of 41.1 degrees centigrade. And hyperplexia is exceptionally rare. Hyperplexia usually results from some intracranial in, uh, insult. For example, cytokines produced in response inside the brain in response to CNS hemorrhage, trauma to the CNS, or infections in the CNS. This is because probably the concentration of cytokine required to cause fever is much lower when they are directly injected inside the brain compared to when they are injected uh, in systemic circulation by peripheral brain. So if the cytokine release site is inside the brain, they can stimulate the hypothalamus to a um, high, higher extent and can produce hyperparexia. Otherwise, systemic infection rarely produces hyperparexia. Treatment of fever, as I already told, is entirely different from uh, uh, hyperthermia. Here, body temperature is not the primary target of uh, treatment. Most fever, it should be remembered, are due to self-limited infections like common viral infections. However, antipyretics can be given for symptomatic relief only. These are the uh, uh, drugs which inhibit this uh, cycle of uh, prostaglandin E2 production or uh, uh, cyclic AMP production, thereby reducing the hypothalamic set point to the normal thermic level and provides symptomatic release, relief. These drugs include aspirin, paracetamol, non steroidals like ibuprofen and diclofenac. They are all equally effective. Glucocorticoids act at, uh, at two levels by inhibition of phospholipase A2 in the very beginning of the cycle and by blocking the transcription of messenger RNA for the pyrogenic cytokine. Antipyretics do not impact clinical course of illness, neither delay or hasten recovery, but they provide symptomatic relief. And on the other hand, they can mask the effect of antibiotic uh, treatment for bacterial infection, so their use should be done sparingly only. External cooling will be required in cases of hyperparexia where there is very high uh, temperatures. This can be uh, uh, done by similar mechanisms like rapid sponging and fanning or ice packs, but is usually not required. This is the mechanism of action of uh, antipyretics. The process starts from here. The membrane lipids are acted upon by phospholipase A2 leads to production of arachidonic acid, which is further metabolized by three uh, mechanisms, the lipoxygenase pathway, the cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 pathways. Because lipoxygenase pathways is uh, not related to our topic, we will focus on COX-1 and COX-2 pathways. The uh, non-steroidals and paracetamol and aspirin act at both COX-1 and COX-2 pathways. So they inhibit uh, prostaglandin production and reduce the hypothalamic set point to normothermic level. COX-2 inhibitors selectively inhibit uh, COX-2 pathway, so they are less efficient in uh, reducing fever, while corticosteroids act at two levels. They inhibit phospholipase A2 from the beginning, and they inhibit inflammatory stimulus by reducing transcription of messenger RNA for the inflammatory markers. Specific treatment for uh, fever. Uh, depends upon the specific diagnosis, and that diagnosis can be made by uh, history, physical examination, and appropriate invest investigation. Uh, examination involves uh, examination for a skin rash, some focus of uh, infection like uh, infected tonsils, splenomegaly. Sometimes the pattern of fever is important. For example, cyclical fever in malaria and borreliosis, or Pell Epstein fever in Hodgkin and other lymphomas. Then temperature pulse dissociation, that is high temperature, but pulse does not rise appropriately, occurs in uh, enteric fever and brucellosis. Then uh, investigations which are appropriately utilized, depending upon the clinical scenario, include blood cultures, uh, blood counts like CBC, seeing for uh, neutrophilia or uh, leukopenia, whatever. Then various cultures, blood culture, urine culture, sputum culture, whatever is appropriate slide for MP if it uh, looks like malaria, then appropriate imaging studies like x-ray, 
all these uh, examination and investigation guide us towards the specific anti-infective therapy. So now we will discuss uh, hypothermia. Hypothermia is an unintentional drop in body's core temperature below 35 degrees centigrade, which uh, is equivalent to 95 degree Fahrenheit. It is of two types, primary accidental hypothermia from exposure to prolonged ambient extremely low temperatures in a previously healthy individual. And secondary hypothermia when there is a, some comorbid condition which predisposes the person to uh, hypothermia. Symptoms and signs of hypothermia are non-specific and markedly variable and depend upon patient's underlying health and circumstances of cold exposure. Accurate cold body temperature measurements are very essential. So a core temperature uh, thermometer like rectal or esophageal thermometer should be used, which reads to very low levels, below 25 degrees centigrade, so that uh, accurate uh, assessment of hypothermia is uh, achieved. These are various risk factors for uh, hypothermia, uh, including extremes of age, elderly and neonates, environmental conditions, like exposure uh, um, by occupational or sports related or immersion in cold water, toxicological and pharmacological agents like ethanol, phenothiazine, barbiturates, these are or inhibitory uh, drugs which uh, reduce body metabolism, inefficient fuel in malnutrition because heat is produced by metabolism and that occurs in the presence of adequate fuel. If there is profound malnutrition, then these patients are predisposed to easy hypothermia. Endocrine related like diabetes and hypoglycemia which blunt the autonomic response. Then hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency and hypoglycemia they are all associated with reduced metabolism. Neurological related like cerebrovascular accident, hypothalamic disorder, Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injury they all uh, uh, interfere with the uh, heat conservation mechanisms. Then multi-system uh, diseases like trauma, sepsis, shock, hepatic or renal advanced failures, then burns and extensive burns and exfoliative dermatological condition. In this condition, the skin uh, heat conservation capacity is inefficient, so that leads to excessive loss of heat to the skin. Then inability, uh, immobility or debilitation are themselves risk factors for uh, uh, hypoglycemia. Clinical features are uh, very uh, variable according to severity and this severity is divided into four stages. Stage 1 hypothermia is seen when the core body temperature is between 32 and 35 degrees centigrade. Shivering is still present, patient is hemodynamically stable and is, maintains normal conscious level. This is a minor form. Stage 2 is when core body temperature is between 28 and 32 degrees centigrade. At this level, shivering stops. Bradycardia occurs, pupils are dilated, reflexes are slowed, cold diuresis occurs, leading to dehydration, and there is confusion and lethargy. ECG may show a J wave or J, a wave of Osborne that I will show soon. Stage 3 hypothermia is when cold body temperature is between 28 and 20, 24 and 28 degrees centigrade. It is characterized by loss of consciousness but present vital signs. And stage 4 hypothermia occurs when core body temperature is less than 24 degrees centigrade. At this stage, there is loss of all vital signs, there is coma, loss of reflex, reflexes, asystole, so there is no pulse or uh, ventricular fibrillation, and it may lead to a false impression that the patient is dead despite the presence of reversible hypothermia. This is the J wave or Osborne wave. And this is called J wave because it occurs at the J point. J point is the point where the QRS complex joins the ST segment. This J or joining point shows a new wave deflection like this, which is more prominent in leads, uh, standard leads 2 and uh, just lead 5. This is the J wave or so called Osborne wave. This is significant in hypothermia. So these are the symptoms, early symptoms are shivering, fatigue, loss of coordination and confusion and disorientation, later shivering stops, skin becomes blue due to poor circulation, slowed pulse and slowed breathing and finally loss of consciousness. Treatment of mild uh, stage 1 hyperthermia can be simply by passive external rewarming 
removing or replacing any wet cloths on the body and replace by dry ones, putting in warm environment and asking the patient to start physical activity because he is still conscious, he will start activity which will produce heat and return the body temperature to normal. Active external cooling uh, re rewarming may be required uh, which will be by applying external heat to the patient's skin by warm bedding, heated blankets, heat packs and immersion in a uh, bath of uh, water at 40 degrees centigrade. Stage 2 and 3 hypothermia are treated with the above measures plus more aggressive measures to warm like uh, infusion of warm intravenous fluid or uh, close monitoring of vital signs and looking for cardiac arrhythmias which are quite common during rewarming but usually require no active management and subside spontaneously and for stage 4 hypothermia high quality CPR because patient is pulseless so high quality CPR is started and continued until the patient's core body temperature is at least 32 degrees centigrade and this goes on along with aggressive rewarming efforts. Various type of uh, extracorporeal rewarming uh, options are available which are suitable for this uh, very uh, low levels of body temperature and they are very efficient in increasing body temperature. These options include continuous venovenous in which we take uh, blood from a large vein and pass through extracorporeal system where the blood is heated and the blood, uh, heated blood is returned to the uh, vein again. Uh, definitely because it is a passive circulation it will require ac active uh, pumping device as is also required for hemodialysis and cardiopulmonary bypass but continuous uh, arteriovenous rewarming uh, does not require an external pump because the blood is taken from the artery which uh, contains the pressure of its own which maintains the circulation back towards the uh, venous circulation and meanwhile the blood is being warmed in an extracorporeal system. It should be remembered that uh, rewarming procedure itself had certain uh, complications. These include core temperature after drop. This is because once the circulation is established, the peripheral blood, which is already cooled, returns to the body and causes a further drop in central uh, core temperature. Then rewarming lactic acidosis, which is similar because peripheral blood uh, is pooled, it is not in circulation. And because of glycolysis, it contains a lot of lactic acid. But when circulation is re-established, this uh, peripheral blood is returned to the body and leads to acidosis. Rewarming shock from peripheral vasodilatation and hypovolemia because uh, these patients, I already told that they are dehydrated because of cold-induced enuresis. So once uh, 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 vasodilatation occurs after rewarming, patient may can do, go into sudden drop of blood pressure. So they should be properly rehydrated. Then ventricular fibrillation and other cardiac arrhythmias. Cardiac arrhythmias are quite common. They are more frequently atrial arrhythmias and they usually do not require any active intervention because they spontaneously survive. But ventricular re fibrillation is the one which requires active management by cardiopulmonary by bypass and reverting by some drug, for example, amandron or whatever, according to the condition. After resuscitation, patient must be monitored very closely because of the high likelihood of subsequent multiple organ system failure. So similar to hyperthermia, in hyperthermia also, once you have restored body temperature, patient is still not out of risk and should be monitored for quite some time. Supplementary measures required are insertion of a nasogastric tube to prevent uh, gastric dilatation secondary to decrease bowel motility, indwelling bladder blood catheter, which uh, uh, make us capable of uh, measuring urine output, which is important for maintaining the adequacy of circulation. Then fluid resuscitation by intravenous saline infusion because they are already dehydrated. Cardiac monitoring for any arrhythmias and if required, treatment of these arrhythmias. Addressing to coagulopathies and other hematological disorders like anemia. Coagulopathy are uh, frequently found in these hypothermic people because the coagulation factors become ineffective under very low temperatures. So infusion of uh, fresh frozen plasma or even uh, concentration of uh, coagulation factors are also ineffective because at these low temperatures they are also not effective. Then attention to occult infection. These are quite frequent because the shivering mechanism is blunted 
so we may not have all the signs and symptoms of infection so appropriate cultures uh, should be done and repeated physical examination to find any possibility of underlying infection and should be attention to risk factors which predispose this patient to the hypothermia preventive measures uh, especially for high risk individuals which are the elderly people or those people who were frequently exposed them to cold environment they should be primary focus of prevention and these measures include layered clothing and headgear appropriately covered adequate shelter increased calorie intake is important and avoidance of alcohol with this we end our uh, lecture thank you very much and if someone has any questions can write it in the uh, comment box thank you again